Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first meeting of the uh, St. John Naturalist Club after our summer break. Looking forward to a, to an excellent presentation again this time. And um, I'm just going to make a couple of announcements. Um, the first one is that uh, we're having our 60th anniversary. Um, it's going to be held on the 29th of October from 1 to 4 at River Cross Church in St. John. And it's going to be a chance to meet some old friends and members of the community to celebrate 60 years of learning and sharing knowledge and enjoying good company. So we're excited to start a next de decade of engaging programming and hope to see everybody there. Um, the other thing is a reminder that memberships are due in September. So um, you can visit our, our website to pay online or contact Julie and um, she can um, help you with other ways of paying if you're not um, able to pay online. And Julie has set a, um, a link in the chat that you can follow uh, to, pay off, to pay today if you wish. Um, we've also arranged for a one-time purchase of 60th anniversary ball caps. Um, again, you can contact Julie for information about how to purchase a cap. Um, to avoid having a stock of them, the hats are prepay only, so you have to order in advance, and um, you'll be able to um, order those until the 8th of October. Um, the last announcement I have is uh, many, many of you have seen the announcement about the death of one of our valued club members, Ida McPherson. Um, and many of us wish that we could do something to celebrate her life or show Dave support. Um, so I've reached out to Dave and his family. And Dave said he would appreciate some help with the maintenance of the Nature Trust Preserve at Sea Dog Cove on the Kingston Peninsula. Um, so they, Dave and Ida had been stewards um, of the preserve and it's very important to both of them. So I'm gonna be working out details on what we can do to help with that. Um, I think there'll be trail maintenance, perhaps a boundary survey, a walkthrough for looking for misuse such as hunting ATVs and garbage and so on. So if anybody's interested in paying a tribute to Ida and showing Dave our support, uh, please let me or Julie know. And um, as I get more details, I'll be contacting people with specific information about what we're going to do and, and the date of when we'll be uh, doing that work. And everyone's welcome, whether you knew Ida or not, uh, we'd appreciate any help that you're willing to give. So finally, um, if you want to ask any questions during the presentation, you can use the chat feature um, in Zoom and Julie will uh, raise the questions at the end of the presentation. So I'll, I'll hand over now to uh, Mary Solos, who's the chair of our program committee. Thank you, Vicki. Um, I am delighted this morning to introduce our guest speaker, Claire Ferguson. Claire is the Outreach and Communications Coordinator for the New Brunswick Invasive Species Council. She was born and raised in Fredericton and holds a Bachelor of Science in Environment and Natural Resources from the University of New Brunswick. Through her work with local and national environmental and Indigenous nonprofits, Claire has found a passion for community engagement as well as environmental and science communications. Claire previously worked for the Nature Conservancy of Canada, where she oversaw the Conservation Volunteers event program in the Atlantic region and coordinated the management of over 65 volunteer property and trail stewards. So I'm delighted this morning uh, to pass the uh, camera and mic over to Claire. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mary, Julie, and Vicki for having me this morning. I'm um, very excited to talk to your group about invasive species. Um, and before I get into things, there I am going to have some questions and quizzes um, throughout the presentation. So feel free to put your answers in the chat section. Uh, the presentation will last for about 45 minutes, and then I'll take questions at the end. Um, so. Uh, can everyone see my screen correctly? Yes. Perfect. I'm also going to turn off my video just to help with um, any connections. All right, so intro into invasive species. 
So before I get into anything, I'm just going to talk about the New Brunswick Invasive Species Council for those that are not familiar with us. So we are a small nonprofit organization based out of Fredericton, New Brunswick, but we do travel across the province. And our overall mission is to protect New Brunswick's environmental, economic, and recreational interests from the threat of invasive species. So uh, we have quite a few different projects on the go, but most of our work falls onto three categories. So the first one would be education and awareness. So that would be presentations to groups such as this and attending community events. Uh, we also help to facilitate collaboration and improve management. So oftentimes this is working with our partners, whether through local and federal government, as well as um, various First Nations groups, uh, various um, environmental nonprofits, um, recreational groups, and anyone in between that is impacted by invasive species. And we also try to work as a knowledge hub to provide expertise, uh, not only to other groups, but also to the public as well for managing and protecting our area from invasive species. So before so generally, when we look at invasive species, uh, they can be a wide range of species. So we have some of our larger invasives, such as giant hogweed. Um, right here, we see Asian carp, which is not currently in New Brunswick, but is certainly one that is on our radar. Um, sea lamprey are a great example of, an of a species that is native to New Brunswick, but is invasive somewhere else. Um, we've got our linefish. Uh, some of our invasives fall under the aquatic category. So that would be this example, zebra and quagga mussels. And we also have uh, across the world, many larger invasives. So this is an example of the Burmese python, which is invasive to the Florida Everglades. And then on the very other size, uh, side of that, we have the infamous emerald ash borer, which we do have in New Brunswick. And although this photo is a bit deceiving, the emerald ash borer as an adult is about the size of a grain of rice, but can cause um, very extensive damage. We also have some species that were brought here historically, and we do still consider them invasive, but they have kind of found their niche in the environment, such as European starlings. Um, they were first brought over actually by a group that was very interested in Shakespeare um, a few hundred years ago, and now their populations are in the tens of millions in North America. And kind of in that same category of very small invasives. This is the hemlock woolly adelgid, which luckily we do not have in New Brunswick yet, although unfortunately it is in Nova Scotia and very close by, but what you're actually looking at is those little tiny white fluff balls that are situated on the hemlock uh, stem there. So very tiny and can be sometimes very difficult to notice if you're not actively keeping an eye out for them. And then unfortunately, sometimes invasive species can also be our family pets. So it could be rabbits, turtles, uh, various um, both terrestrial and aquatic species that, you know, you by mistake are let loose, which we'll talk about a little later. And they can have um, caused quite a bit of damage to our natural areas. So um, for those that are jumping in, um, can I just get everyone, uh, if you can name an invasive species um, that you're familiar with, if you want to just put that in the chat box, that would be great. So whether that you have an example that you can think of terrestrial, aquatic, got one example, yep, zebra mussels, Himalayan balsam, yep, giant hogweed and woodland angelica. So we have some that are already familiar with invasives. Japanese knotweed, that is another big one, which we'll mention a little later on as well. That's perfect. Yes, chain pickerel, that's, um, yep, in our aquatic family, but that's great to see that uh, many of you are already familiar with some of the invasives that are in New Brunswick and also ones that are on the horizon. So, 
when we decide and look at whether or not we consider a species to be invasive, for us, it has to meet three different factors. So the first one is that it is non-native. So that could mean it is not originally from and naturalized to an area. Uh, it could be you know, from on the other side of the world in another continent, or it could even just be a, a species from the other west coast of Canada that um, once it's here, it starts to take over. And that leads into our next one, that it spreads rapidly. So in plants, this would look like a plant that completely takes, will take over the forest floor. In insects and in wildlife, this would look like a species that has many, many offspring, um, sometimes even multiple times a year. Um, so their, their populations are able to grow and establish very quickly. And the third factor is that the species is harmful in some way. So oftentimes with invasives, we tend to think of how they're impacting our environment, um, but we also like to take into consideration the negative impacts that they might have to uh, the economy. So for example, impacts to infrastructure or um, impacts to human health even. So like that giant hogweed uh, that was mentioned in the chat, that's one that certainly if you get it on your skin can cause very severe burns. So if we, so if a species is non-native, it spreads rapidly and it is harmful in some manner, that is when we consider it to be invasive. So now we're gonna go into a little quiz um, and feel free to um, you know, put your answers to this in the chat and um, don't worry too much about getting the right or wrong answer because by the end of this presentation, you will all be um, beginner invasive species experts. So to start off with, does anyone recognize this plant that is found in New Brunswick? And as a bit of a hint, the, yep, the leaves of three, let it be. So this is poison ivy. So poison ivy is one that as many of you are familiar Probably if you're familiar with it, you know that it does cause severe, it can cause, you know, rashes if you get in contact with it. Um, but interestingly enough, poison ivy is not an invasive species. So although poison ivy does cause, um, you know, harm to us, and sometimes when you do see it growing, it will, you know, take over a little bit of an area. It's one that is native to our environment and will not completely take over a forested or a field area. So we do not consider it invasive. Now this next one. So this is the very common tomato plant. Can anyone think and guess whether or not this would be considered an invasive species? Okay, we've got one yes to invasive. I imagine there's, yeah, we've got a few yeses. So this is an interesting one and a little bit of a trick for you all. So tomato plants um, are not a native species to New Brunswick, um, but if many of you, if some of you have had gardens, um, you know, that tomato plants do require, you know, quite a bit of care, you know, really just to get them going. And oftentimes, you know, if someone were to leave a bed of tomato plants, they're not going to completely overrun an area in a few years. So these are not considered invasive, but we like to um, call them non-invasive exotic plants. So they're still not from this area, but um, currently are not acting invasive. Uh, now this is an interesting one. I'm this is wild turkeys, and I imagine you all have probably seen them in southern New Brunswick, you know, along roadways and in fields, and um, maybe you've had some run-ins with them. So just put in the chat if you think whether or not wild turkeys are invasive, or if they are native.
Mm -hmm. yep. So we've got some mix. So Vicky said that she believes some of them have been introduced, some wandered in naturally, so non-invasive. We've got invasive, non-native, but not invasive. We've got lots of answers. So this is an interesting case and um, really a good example of how with some species, really our um, personal and values as a society can change whether or not we view a species as invasive or not. So wild turkeys are ones that um, they have been kind of slowly making their way up from the uh, U.S. states. However, there have been populations um, that you know, there is no kind of connection in between the movement. So it's believed that there could have been potentially some releases at some point. Um, and this is interesting because if you are someone that, you know, enjoys hunting and enjoys hunting turkeys, you may not be as inclined to consider these as invasive. However, if, um, you know, they're coming into your yard, they're digging up your garden and your front lawn, or, you know, on a daily basis, you're having to avoid them in the road, you may be much more likely to consider them invasive. So for wild turkeys, um, really the jury is still out on whether or not they will become more invasive. As I mentioned, they are slowly making their way up. However, some of the populations have just popped up. So this is one where really we're going to have to wait and see whether or not they become um, more invasive um, in New Brunswick. And now this final example, uh, this is one that I did show earlier, but this is zebra and quagga mussels. So it's not this larger muscle, it's all these small, tiny, tiny muscles that have attached onto it. And this is one that luckily we do not have in New Brunswick, but is definitely an invasive species and one we do not want to have. And as a final um, question, this is blue-green algae. Can anyone put in the chat and guess whether or not they believe that this is considered invasive or if this is native to the environment in New Brunswick? So we've got some yes, invasive. Oh, on the other end, we have native. Yep, and this is, yeah, Vicki, you've kind of hit the nail on the head with your response. So this is blue-green algae, which many of us know as blue-green algae, but actually it is a cyanobacteria, which is a fancier word for a type of bacteria. And this is actually native to our environment in New Brunswick and records of it being present can go back to a few hundred years. However, the reason why we are hearing it talked about more and seeing more is um, because of the change in our climate, our, the increasing water temperatures, and also in areas where they're experiencing quite a bit of runoff, um, you're more likely to see these blooms pop up. So while this is you know, a health issue, unfortunately, because um, some dogs have passed away after eating this, we do not consider it an invasive species issue. So that is the end of the quiz uh, for now, um, but I'm gonna jump right into some of the impacts of invasive species. So on the more um, environment and our natural area side, uh, one of the impacts would be the increased predation of native species. This would be also particularly on species at risk that are already um, having a difficult time. And into this also is the alteration of predator prey dynamics. So unfortunately, because when these species are being introduced, oftentimes they don't have any predators that are naturally in our environment. They may have predators in their native environment, but not here. So oftentimes what happens is they will, um, you know, either directly prey on our native species, but also compete with our native, our native predators um, for um, food as well. Uh, we can see in the bottom left corner, this is an example that um, a plant that's quite common in 
certain areas of New Brunswick, but this is garlic mustard. Um, so as shown in this photo, many invasives will compete with our native species for food and space and resources. So in this example, sunlight would be a big resource and space. Uh, invasive species can also bring and be new diseases. So this example here is white nose syndrome, which unfortunately has negatively impacted many of our bat species in New Brunswick. But how this was actually discovered to be moved between cave to cave was infected um, cave hiking gear and the disease was being brought from one spot to another. Now to go more onto the societal impacts, um, with, invasive, with the arrival of invasives, they can decrease our ecosystem services. So essentially um, what this means is the, imp the different things that our ecosystems do for us. So a great example of this would be uh, how our wetlands um, help with flood prevention. So if we have, you know, a typical, you know, normal wetland that we have, you know, they're great for uptaking water um, beside other things to, you know, providing habitat to various native species. Um, but if we, for example, if, a if an invasive grass comes in and takes over this wetland, Oftentimes what's going to happen is we lose those native species, which oftentimes will uptake a lot more of that water. Um, so the wetland is not functioning as it normally would. So then it's decreasing the service um, that would help us, which would be uptaking water and helping to prevent floods. Um, we also see impacts to infrastructure. So in this example here, this is tiny zebra and quagga mussels that have completely encrusted a boat propeller. And this could all, they can also impact um, water intake. So, and many of our natural areas. Um, and if we've got invasives, you know, that will um, start to take over infrastructure, then we have to remove them. We also see um, impacts to human health. So the example that I mentioned earlier was giant hogweed and how, uh, the sap, if it interacts with sunlight, can cause third degree burns. But another example we have is those zebra and quagga mussels again, which unfortunately are very sharp. So if you're in an area where these mussels have encrusted a beach or your um, outdoor recreation equipment, um, it can be dangerous um, and you certainly don't want to have your feet cut up in the water. And impacts to recreation. So this example here is an invasive aquatic plant that you can see is completely taking over and um, has just become entangled in this propeller. And you know, if you have a water body that is completely being taken over by this, it's not going to be enjoyable to boat in, swim in, fish in. So it's impacting the ways that we enjoy our um, beautiful outdoor areas. And this is another photo of a um, potential health impact. So what you're seeing there jump out of the water is a species I mentioned that we don't have in New Brunswick called Asian carp. Uh, it's not even in Canada yet, but it's making its way up the Mississippi River. And as a defense me mechanism, Asian carp will actually jump out of the water um, to try and get away from any predators, but they can also be startled by the propellers of boats. So unfortunately, there have actually been a number of people that have been injured after these fish have um, jumped out of the water and have struck them. So that's another impact uh, as well, and certainly would make enjoy being on the water a little bit more risky and not as enjoyable. Now to go into some eradication and control methods. So these would be methods that would be used once a species has become too established to the point where eradic eradication may be a bit more difficult um, or take many years to get to. So this example here, is with an invasive plant, Japanese knotweed. So one option to remove large patches of invasive plants could be the application of herbicides. 
uh, with some invasives, we also have to go in and actually manually remove them. So this is an invasive reed, um, invasive grass that people are having to go in and essentially cut down and gather. Uh, another method is also hunting. So there actually are so many Burmese pythons that have become invasive in the Florida Everglades that they've actually been able to create a whole show of a group just going out and hunting them. So hunting is an option as well. Um, sometimes specialized equipment is also created to help with controlling them. So this is an example of an, a watercraft that has been equipped with almost like a mower to help dig up and remove some of these invasives. But usually at that point, um, it's far beyond eradication and it's mostly just about managing the species that is there. And there's also very creative ways um, that we try to control invasive species and control their spread. So this is an example of a dog that has been trained to sniff out invasive mussels, uh, similarly to an avalanche dog um, learning how to find people in avalanches. So this sign is essentially saying, you know, we're not looking for any um, you know, things that you may have on your boat, legal or illegal, but we are just looking for invasive mussels. And when we look at eradication and control methods, oftentimes there are barriers that we run into um, that may impact um, their effectiveness. So the first one is that um, oftentimes eradicating, trying to eradicate or even just control an invasive once it has become established can be very um, time costly. So that, for example, in this photo here, you can see there's a person that is injecting an herbicide into a stem, a singular stem of Japanese knotweed. So if you can imagine, you know, if you have a smaller step, a uh, smaller patch of Japanese knotweed, um, you know, this may not take up as much time, but if any of you have seen the larger patches of Japanese knotweed in either your communities or by the sides of highways, you know, you may get a patch with hundreds of stems. So this would be very, um, it would take a lot of time to try and go in and apply this method. Oftentimes too, um, these various methods can also be quite um, costly. So this example here is um, one that they have tried um, in various states to deal with wild pigs. And what they're essentially doing is they have hired hunters to go into helicopters to try and hunt down these wild pigs. So if you can only imagine the cost of hiring people and having helicopters go and um, try and find these pigs, it would be quite costly. And unfortunately, this method over time has actually proven not to be effective for this specific case. And sometimes, you know, when we are trying to think of different control methods, um, as I mentioned, we can get a bit creative. So this is an example of a lionfish cookbook. Um, so some of our invasives, they can actually be eaten. Um, so it is an interesting point um, to make, but the reason why that we don't consider this an effective control method is the time that it would take and the amount of an invasive that we would have to consume to actually control it um, wouldn't probably, you know, create that much of an impact where the species would continue expanding. So while that is an interesting point to make, um, it's certainly not one that is going to fully control an invasive. So the question that we do have, you know, is, you know, why not just get rid of them? And so, as I mentioned, the challenges that we face with removals and eradicating an invasive species are that um, removals can be labor intensive, they can be very time consuming, they can be costly, and sometimes they are more effective than others. And sometimes it takes a few years to figure out you know, what is going to be effective in our area for removing this. So therefore, what we are trying to do is, you know, instead of being reactive, so, you know, reacting to a species once it is here, to try to be more preventative and prevent new introductions and further spread. So this is an uh, example um, of the typical invasion curve of what a 
species would follow once it becomes invasive. So as we can see on the bottom, the y-axis, we have time going by. And on the two x-axes on the side, we've got the increasing area invested and the increasing costs of control. So if you can see in the very bottom left-hand corner, we've got the introduction. So this would be when a species is first introduced, you know, a you know, fish has first been released into a new water body, a plant has you know, first been planted in an area. And if we go up that curve a little bit, we hit the point of detection. So usually this is what's happening is maybe someone in a you know, environmental group or in local government has noticed this invasive or even just a member of the public has noticed this invasive and thought, oh, that doesn't, you know, look like something that I normally see around. Um, but, you know, they may or may not know what it is. So, unfortunately, what happens then is um, usually the alarm bells have not started to ring yet. However, if the alarm bells were rung at that point, we realized, oh, you know, we caught it very early on. Um, eradication would be, you know, quite simple because the area invested is quite low and the cost to eradicate it would also be low as well. But unfortunately, that's not usually when uh, a species is found. Um, typically, you know, it's much further along in time that people actually begin to be more aware. So this would be, um, you know, someone has tried to ring the alarm bells, maybe it hasn't been effective and um, it's taken a while to get people to notice that this is an issue. Um, but once it becomes aware, the general public becomes more aware. So this would be, you know, people are noticing all these trees on their street are dying or they're noticing that every time they go out and fish on this water bay, waterway, they're finding, you know, fish that, you know, five or 10 years ago, they know weren't there. Um, usually at this point, this is when many people are going, you know, to their local government, local organized, you know, invasive related organizations, sounding the alarm bells. But unfortunately, at this point, eradication would be very unlikely because we can see the area of that has been infested has just grown and quite a bit of um, effort would be required. So this will be you know, sending people out to go in and remove it, trying to find where new patches have come up. Um, and typically at this point, this is when plans would start to come into place of controlling it. And as we can see, as the curve goes further, eventually the species may hit a point where really we're just focusing on managing it and controlling it because um, it would just be impossible to eradicate it. But Unfortunately, at this point, even just the management and control costs would be very high. So what our goal is, is to try instead of reaching a point where most of the invasives have gone too far that we can do something about them, we want to try and create more awareness so that people are reaching out to us at this point of detection very early on in the scale where it is feasible um, and there are possibilities that we can go out and manage and you know, hopefully try and eradicate a species. Um, and oftentimes it's much easier to prevent new introductions than to deal with them once they have arrived. So now going into prevention, which is really what um, I'm going to be talking about today in various species. Generally, we have kind of two categories of different ways that an invasive species can be introduced. So the first one is natural spread. So this would be um, a category of what factors that we can't control. So this would be, you know, pieces of an invasive plant floating downstream or a bird that has eaten a berry off of an invasive plant and has pooped it elsewhere. Um, or wind. So this is natural movements that we can't control. But there is a second category of invasion, which is through human activity. And these are certainly factors that we can control, um, oftentimes with just simple changes to our day to day. So under the category of prevention, um, our hope and what we have um, at the New Brunswick Invasive Species Council is many programs to try 
to adopt different behaviors um, and tell the public about them to help prevent the spread of invasive species. So often these are just simple steps to help um, prevent hitchhikers from coming from new areas or accidentally starting a new invasion. And we've got various different programs for many different activities. So uh, when we think of, you know, terrestrial areas, you know, and playing, you know, being outdoors um, on land, some ways that invasive species can be moved around could be seeds of invasive plants that can be stuck into your hiking boot and the treads of tires. So this could be bikes, ATVs, anything with a tire. Um, seeds getting stuck to pets. So uh, if any of you have dogs and you know they, you've let them go in field areas and they come back covered in little tiny seeds, that's an example of way that invasive could be brought from one place to another. If you bring your dog somewhere and then go home with them. Also horses as well. Um, and generally not cleaning off recreational equipment. So it could be, as I mentioned earlier, you know, your hiking boots, your um, your bikes, but also this could include things like camping gear. And to help prevent the spread of invasives um, in these categories, we have a program called Play Clean Go. So this is encouraging people to, once you've gone outside and you've played, so you've done your hiking, your biking, um, then remembering to clean off your equipment before you go elsewhere, and then you can head on your way. So some invasives that um, are easily spread through these different pathways would be garlic mustard, which is um, if you go to St. Andrews, you'll see quite a bit of it around the community. Another one that we see quite a bit is um, Phragmites. Uh, it's also called European common reed, and this is an invasive grass um, that as you can see in this photo, it's very dense. The individual plants can grow to be over five meters tall. And this is a huge issue in our wetland area. So this plant is currently in New Brunswick. It is particularly invasive around the Moncton area, but we are now seeing patches of it elsewhere and is one we really would like people to report to us. And as some mentioned, earlier about different examples of invasives. We have woodland angelica, so this will cause that rash. Um, and in the same family, we also have the invasive cow parsnip and giant hogweed. Um, if we're now going to more the aquatic side of things, um, various pathways of invasion could include um, invasive plants or um, invasive wildlife or you know mussels hitching rides on different watercraft. So this could be boats, but also good to keep in mind canoes, kayaks, and paddle boards as well, and also boat trailers. And within that, not cleaning off that equipment after you've been in one water body and going to another. And also good to keep in mind too, if you're going, say, up a river as well. Um, in this category, we also have, which has historically been more of an issue, um, ballast water tank. So that's the water that is being held in the tanks of boats to um, help them balance, balance out. So this is how zebra mussels, unfortunately, were brought over to North America. And luckily now that there are more rules and regulations in place um, internationally, but however, on a um, across the country. It still could be an issue if someone is, say, coming from more Western provinces to um, the Atlantic provinces. And what we hope to do and encourage anyone using water, various watercraft is to clean, drain, and dry um, their boat. So cleaning it off, making sure there's no pieces of plants stucking, stuck to the boat, draining any of the water that is sitting in there out in case there could be invasives hiding in there and also drying that off as well to prevent the spread of aquatic invasives. So I'm gonna go into two smaller case studies with this. So the first one is Eurasian water milfoil. So this is unfortunately a invasive that we do have here in New Brunswick. Currently it's just limited to the St. John River and some of the tributaries of that. Um, but certainly we do not want it spreading any further because how this is a huge issue is that it creates these very long, dense um, and thick mats that sit on the top of the water um, and throughout the water. And 
not only um, leave no room for other species, so it's outcompeting our native aquatic plant species, um, it's changing uh, fish habitat, um, and it clogs waterways. And because it's so dense, it will actually alter the flow, which then we can see things um, like increased mosquito activity, which is not great. Uh, this is called the zombie plant because how this often is moved around is if a little tiny piece of it is broken off with a node. So you can see um, that more grade photo with the close up. If a tiny piece of that is broken off um, and transported elsewhere, whether that's um, you know by a boat, it's been cut off and it's stuck and it's gone somewhere else, it will just start growing from there and create new plants. Um, it can survive out of water during low water levels and it can also overwinter. So this is certainly one that um, we do not want to have moved to any of our lake areas because not only is it impacting um, the water bodies um, ecologically, but also um, recreationally as well. So this is an example, this is photos taken by the Canadian Rivers Institute out of Fredericton. And as you can see in this first photo in 2016, um, the water is you know, clear, people are swimming in it. Um, and it was only a year prior in 2015 where it was first spotted in New Brunswick. So this is kind of the first year that they've been looking for the species more here in the St. John River. And in the middle photo, you'll see three years later, this is earlier in the season in 2019. And you can see these mats of Eurasian water milfoil have really started to take over that water body. And the photo on the far right is in 2019. And as you can see, you really can't see any clear water. So all of those that invasive is completely shading out um, any native plants that would grow there changing that habitat. And certainly if you're trying to boat or canoe or swim in it, it's not going to be a great experience. Um, another issue that has been seen elsewhere in the province is once Eurasian milfoil is found on a lake or a water body, if it does take over to these extents, it can decrease property values up to 19%. Um, so certainly also economic impacts as well. We also have zebra and quagga mussels. So luckily these are not in New Brunswick yet, although they have been in the Great Lake water system since um, late eighties and early 1990s. So these are small freshwater mussels that are filter feeders. Um, and how they have their large impact is mostly based on the number of um, individuals there would be in a colony. So each colony can be comprised of, of over 700,000 individuals per meter cubed. So what happens is these guys will tend to over filter the water, taking out that phytoplankton and the important kind of base to our um, food um, the different species levels. Therefore, it um, has those rippling effects of taking out other species that are in waterways that require those base level feeders. And as you can see in the photos, because their colonies are so dense and encrusted, they'll essentially stick on anything that is in the water. So they'll get stuck to buoys, they will get stuck to propellers. This is a photo of a water intake that has completely been encrusted. So um, not only does it diminish um, the ecological integrity of a water body, but also it's very costly to go in and remove these species every single year. And this is a photo just generally showing the spread of, these, of this invasive across um, the US and how they're often um, moved around is through their early, early stages, which are called villagers, which this is the challenge with uh, zebra and quagga mussels is these villagers are almost impossible to see with the naked eye. So we can see in this photo where they were first found in the Great Lakes and they have spread through um, the river systems in the US. So some of that spread we can see is connected to those main early introduction points. However, our concerns would be with these outlier points. So these are random um, areas where they have found them. And we can assume because they're not connected to the main 
riverways um, that these have been um, mistakenly brought to different parts of the country. Um, and unfortunately, zebra mussels can survive many days um, in ballast water and also on trailers and um, if in cases of high humidity, they could survive many days out of water. So um, that's why we also say too, it's not enough always to just, you know, have your boat or your watercraft out of water for a few days before going somewhere else, because oftentimes they can survive um, in these conditions of being out of water. Um, we also have invasives that are moved through the movement of wood. So whether this be commercial wood imports or shipping internationally or through the movement of firewood. So for this, we encourage people to buy local and burn local. So buy firewood essentially as close to where you're going to burn it as possible to prevent the spread of invasive insects. One that I imagine many of you have heard of is the emerald ash borer. So as I mentioned earlier on, this is a very small iridescent green beetle um, and the adult is about the size of a grain of rice. And um, for the emerald ash borer, um, most of their impacts happen when they're actually in the larval stage. So the females will lay about 50 to 70 eggs only on ash trees. So in New Brunswick, we have white, green and black ash. And then what the larvae will do is they will eat away at the cambium layer of the tree. So this is the layer of the tree that is uh, moving around water and nutrients, which is very important for the tree. Um, so over a number of years, what will happen is once a tree is infested, it will essentially kind of be killed from the inside out. And once the emerald ash borer has arrived in an area, it will kill up to 99% of um, ash trees. So, and interestingly enough, um, in New Brunswick, we actually do have some beetles that look at a distance similar to the emerald ash borer, for example, the tiger beetle. And the adults of the emerald ash borer are actually only in flight for about two weeks out of the year. So what we do recommend to people is if they notice an ash tree that is seeing signs of decline. So the canopy is dying back. We're seeing epicormic shoots. So smaller shoots of trees coming out of the bottom of the stump or the bark is starting to be stripped back by um, different birds and woodpeckers. That's when we would recommend people to look more closely at the tree to see if they spot the emerald ash borer because oftentimes the tree will start to show signs of decline a few years after an emerald ash borer has already um, been in the tree. And this is just showing an example of the negative impact of the emerald ash borer. So this is within a three year um, period. So in the first photo, we can see that this street in Ohio um, has beautiful ash trees. And just three years later, we can see that most of the ash trees have unfortunately died and will probably have to be removed. And similarly, this is a map of the US where um, the emerald ash borer has been detected. Um, it was first detected on the border of the US and Canada in Windsor, Canada and in Detroit, Michigan. Um, but unfortunately, so we can see kind of a radiating spread, but similarly with um, the zebra and quagga mussels, there have been abnormal detections in areas that are you know, hundreds of miles away from other close detection. So we can assume what has happened is that infected wood, infested wood has been brought to these areas. So, and the species will spread from there, unfortunately. Um, other ways that invasives can be introduced is through being a food source, being introduced to try and get rid of other species, which more so has been done historically. Um, the release of unwanted aquarium pets and plants um, and introducing species uh, for hunting and game purposes. So to help prevent the spread of invasives through these methods, we recommend generally don't let it loose. So although some people may, um, you know, think that, oh, you know, there's a pet rabbit or a fish that I have that 
you know, I can't take care of it anymore. Um, you know, the best thing I can do is release it to the environment. So this is a myth um, because unfortunately one of two things will happen. Either a species will not survive very long out in the wild because they're not equipped to do that. Um, and unfortunately it's a cruel way to go. Um, or on the other side, opposite side of that, they will flourish and will start to take over an area. So some invasive species that fall into this category would be goldfish, red-eared sliders, which is a turtle commonly sold in pet stores, and wild pigs, which we do not have in New Brunswick yet, but are a big issue in the western part of the U.S. and also western Canada as well. And finally, some invasives are introduced um, by food source. They're planted in gardens. Um, and also can be spread invasive plants through not cleaning off garden equipment and lawn care, or even transported in um, the soil of plants. So this is one that we recommend people generally uh, to be plant wise. So this is a new program that we are getting started in New Brunswick just this year and encouraging people who are, you know, planting any plants outdoors to check the soil, make sure you're planting native plants to help prevent the spread of invasive plants. Uh, here are a few examples of plants that would fall into this category. So as mentioned earlier, we have Japanese knotweed. That's one that we are seeing in parts of the province and it is very invasive. And these, and they will actually, uh, the roots and the plant system will go through concrete. So a very hardy plant. We also have Japanese barberry, um, which is often planted as an ornamental. All of these have been planted as an ornamental for some reason or another, but have become invasive. And there's also English ivy as another example. So you might say, okay, how now, you know, you, I, you know all about invasives now, um, but how can you get involved with helping um, to prevent the spread of invasives. So one thing that we recommend um, the general public to do, and I imagine you know, with your group where many of you are already outdoors enjoying our natural areas, is to report, identif report invasive species when you see them. And it's great also to learn how to identify them. So we recommend that people submit any observations of invasive species that they see to iNaturalist. So if you haven't heard of iNaturalist, it is a great app where you can um, upload any photos of any plants, insects, wildlife, fungi, and the app itself will identify the plant for you. And there's also specialists across the country that will help to identify it. And we use this app because we do have a project called Invasive Species in New Brunswick. So any up photos of invasives that are uploaded, we automatically see that information and it helps us to keep an eye out for new um, observations of invasives in different areas. Because really at the end of the day, better data is better management. So if we fully know the idea of where an invasive is and how much it has spread, it helps us to then be able to better manage it. Um, here's some more general information and that concludes the presentation. So thank you very much uh, for listening to this presentation and I'm excited to see if you have any questions to answer. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, so there definitely are some questions already in the chat that have been coming through. Um, I have one from Vicki. Um, she says, with global warming, we may need to encourage non-native species as our native species are negatively affected by the changes. Mm -hmm. It'll be interesting to see how our view of invasive species changes. Are there formal scientific discussions of how we should change the way we view and address invasive species? Yes, that's definitely a good question and almost a bit of a two-parted question because, yes, I think there, there certainly are discussions that are happening about, you know, with our changing climate and as temperatures change, um, you know, not only 
the impacts that that'll have to our native species, but also what invasives we may become more susceptible. There actually has been mapping that has been done based out of the US on areas of North America that are going to become more susceptible to having invasive species. And unfortunately out of their study, um, Northeastern US was the most susceptible and we can assume that we are also in that category. So there are certainly discussions and also as species naturally move up, I think that will change discussions as well. For example, those wild turkeys, you know, once species are migrating themselves, um, that's when we, you know, would have these discussions. Um, but it's certainly ones that I think will be interesting to see how they change um, and what, you know, over time we have some species that may become less invasive or more invasive. Um, but certainly when we are looking at um, introducing you know, for example, plants um, and species that may be introduced, we might, you know, people might lean more towards because our native ones are doing, are not doing as well. Really what it would come down to is um, certainly there are plants that we have around, like the tomatoes, those exotic plants that are non-invasive. So that's a, those would be ones that we would probably encourage people, you know, if you are looking at, you know, if you're having a hard time planting native species, look for non-invasive exotic plants to plant um, because we do realize some of our invasives are our native plants you know we can't just say okay everyone go out and plant you know pipewort um, in your um, you know in your garden or some of our other natives that are not really meant to be transplanted but I think it's certainly going to be interesting discussions and really it'll just come down to if some of these exotics become more invasive, just making sure that they're not being planted in our garden going forward. All right, and the next question from Mary, should we be cleaning aquatic gear, like for example, waders and boat propellers with a certain soap or chemical between water bodies? And what do you recommend? I would recommend, so there are different cleaning products that can be used um, to uh, clean off different boats, even just as more of a um, boat maintenance perspective. But really what we would recommend even just at the base is even just making sure that you're hosing off just even with water, if you wanna you know, throw in some soap in there as well, but really just making sure that you're wiping down anything. It doesn't even necessarily have to include any products, um, but just making sure you're rinsing off um, your equipment. And yes, that does include um, fishing gear as well and fishing equipment. I know that in past there has been issues with invasives getting stuck into the felts on the bottom of um, wading boots. So there are now different companies that are moving more towards having just plastic bottoms as well to prevent them moving in there. So that's what we, Clean Drain Dry has in the past been more focused on boats and aquatic um, watercraft, but we certainly open it up to anything that you're using in the water. So even, you know, floaties, for example, could have something stuck to it. So good to clean everything off in between waterways and just rinse it down. Wow. So that's a lot to think of. Um, so the next question is from Ray. Will herbicide kill Angelica? And what about Roundup? So we so yes, so that has been a product that has been used um, more so on um, in different areas and more so on invasions where it has a plant has completely taken over to the point where um, it would be impossible to go in and either remove it all or there's no native plants. But unfortunately, this is sometimes where we have, you know, these pros and cons with different methods of removal because for example with um, using an herbicide you know you're going it's not just going to impact that plant it could impact all the native plants that we have around and also there are certain environments that you're not going to want to use that in so if you've got say infestation of woodland angelica right along a wetland you know that's not an option um, to use in that area. So really what we would write you know with some of those large infestations um, it, it can be challenging because it almost may be too much um, to actually go in and try and remove. But then what we would recommend is when people do see um, 
plants that may have just popped up outside of the large patch to try and remove those by hand. Um, so with all of these are certainly different. It really depends on, you know, the scale of the infestation you're dealing with, um, what methods to use. But I would say most of the time with using herbicides, um, you know, any of those, those are kind of the last, you know, the last effort to just try and control something. Okay, and from Jean, what is the present status of purple loose stripe? I understand that two beetles were introduced to control it. Yes, so um, at one point, yes, two beetles were actually introduced and purple loose strife is a plant. So it is an invasive plant. Um, previously, it had um, quite a bit of negative impacts in Ontario um, and in Quebec as well. And we kind of call that almost the one of the early poster childs of invasive plants because it did get quite a bit of press coverage. However, for us, uh, for our organization, while it is still under our umbrella of invasives, and if people have it on their property, we recommend um, people to remove it. It certainly has not had as much of an impact in New Brunswick as was seen elsewhere. Um, so it, there are certain areas of the province where we have seen it pop up more. Um, but it's believed that it's actually has stayed more under control in New Brunswick because those beetles were introduced to the environment um, after um, quite a bit of testing. And it's thought that that could be a reason why we're not seeing as much of an impact in here um, in New Brunswick. So we do recommend if people do have it on their property to remove it, but it's one where it's kind of on lower of our list of efforts, just where, you know, it is in certain areas, you know, it's too far gone um, for us to go in and remove and our resources are limited. So we try and focus on um, some other species. And then the next question is from Shelly. Can you suggest the best way to remove Japanese knotweed or direct to any resources on this? Sure, I can, I can definitely, we do have some resources on our website, which is um, the New Brunswick Invasive Species Council about removing Japanese knotweed. But one of the main things with Japanese knotweed is uh, research has shown that this is one of the invasive plants that you really don't want to dig up. Um, it often actually can become more disturbed and you can agitate a patch if you do start to try and dig it up by its rhizome and root system, which is one of the ways that it spreads. So what we recommend um, that people do, if you have a patch, is to ideally before it goes to seed, where it has all those nice white uh, flowery seeds on it, is to cut the plants off at the base. And then there is a, a tactic that you can do. It's called, um, it's essentially called tarping. So you can purchase a dark colored tarp and then you cover the area after you have cut off um, the stems of the plant. And the idea is that um, if you have it up, particularly in the spring, summer, that the temperatures of the sun will actually help to kind of cook the root rooting systems and help it to um, prevent the spread any further. Um, that's one tactic that the Nature Trust of New Brunswick has actually been doing at one of their nature preserves in New Brunswick to try and keep the Japanese knotweed down. So that's um, really what I would recommend um, trying to do. Um, but also it's good to keep in kind of along with that two things is that with many invasives, it takes multiple, it may take multiple years to go in um, and to try and remove them to make a dent. So, you know, if after the first year you notice some plants are still popping up, um, you know, don't ditch any of your, all your efforts yet. It may take, you know, two or three or four years to, um, of the same method to make that work. Um, and also when you're removing the plants itself, um, certainly do not put them in your compost um, because that will spread them further. So we recommend people put them in trash bags and either set them out in the sun for two to three weeks to solarize, similar to the tarping method, um, or and or just directly take those garbage bags to your local waste disposal to prevent them from spreading further. 
So if you've got a patch, it's certainly certainly have some work ahead of you, but um, you can definitely um, make a dent in it. Okay, thank you so much, Claire. Um, I don't see any more questions right now, so I'm just going to pass it right over to Mary. It's a wonderful uh, talk, Claire. Thank you so much. And I'm certainly glad that you uh, went over the Japanese knotweed. I'm going to put some of that to use because we've been uh, battling it here for years. Um, I really liked the, uh, the invasion curve, too. I think that... Um, I think that gives us lots of information on actually what you're dealing with and, and what's involved just in, uh, in, I guess, the importance of early detection and making people aware. And uh, so I, I really appreci appreciate the talk today. Thank you so much, Claire. Oh. And, um, and, you know, we could have probably separate uh, um presentations on all the different uh, invasive species and and still learn a lot so uh yes thank you very much claire and uh, i'd like to say to everyone else um thank you for joining us this morning and our next um meeting will be october 15th when we'll have shailene wallace here and uh, she's from the nature trust of new brunswick and she'll be talking about her work on amphibians so thank you everyone and have a great day. Thank you, everyone.